coming up next on the Arizona Horizon, Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton makes his monthly appearance on the show. And we'll dive into a new book about an Arizona man who influenced water management and helped shape our state's growth and development. That's next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Christine Estes, sitting in for Ted Simons, who has the night off. The Phoenix-based parent company of the University of Phoenix announced another loss today. The Apollo Education Group posted a $5 million quarterly loss in August, citing a drop in student enrollment. The for-profit university has been hit by tougher regulations, questions about its student recruitment activities, and more competition for online students. Once a month, Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton appears on Arizona Horizon to talk about the current issues facing Arizona's biggest city, issues like disconnected youth. Here now is Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton. Thanks for coming in. Appreciate Happy it. Happy Good to see you. Hey, we've got a big event coming up next week um, designed to help disconnected youth. Before we talk about that, explain what that means. When we say disconnected youth, who are we talking about? So there is a population of young people, ages 16 to 24, so school age and a little bit beyond school age, but that cohort of individuals that uh, are not currently enrolled in school and not currently employed, so they're not really on a pathway to success. That age group with that uh, qualifications, if you will, that's the, that's the cohort that we called disconnected youth. And unfortunately, a report came out last year that indicated that our community, this region, had the highest percentage of disconnected youth in the entire country. When I saw that report, I said, this is not acceptable. We don't give up on anyone. These young people still have their entire lives ahead of them, and we have to do more to support them to get them back into a positive uh, pathway. But that's disconnected you, 16 to 24, not currently working, not currently enrolled in school. That report was really startling because it said nearly 20%. So we're talking about one in five people in that age group. Um, yesterday, I know the council approved a resolution joining with Maricopa County for something called Opportunities for yep. Youth. Tell us about that. There's a, there's a lot of going on in this area. And what was interesting is that there's a lot of incredible nonprofits in this community doing great things for youth, but there was not one that was specifically in the space of disconnected youth, or we like to put the more positive spin on it and say opportunity youth. That's the definition that I like to use. There wasn't a particular group that was focused in on bringing these young people back into positive activity. So we put together an Opportunities for Youth Task Force. Councilman Laura Pastor from the Phoenix City Council is one of the co-chairs. We're working very closely with Dr. Don Covey from McKeesa, the Maricopa County Educational Services uh, Agency, and a, a leading list of nonprofit business leaders foundations. And we're gonna come up with solutions to the issue of disconnected youth. The reality is, is that we can't give up on a generation. 20 plus percent of students 16 to 24, or young people 16 to 24, not on a positive path right now. These are lost years. It's too important that we get these people back into the economy, either through education, through employment, or through job training. We have a lot of work to do, and we're rolling up our sleeves, and we are getting to work. The goal I read was to move that near 20% down to 11%. Is there a timetable when it comes locally to addressing yeah, we want to make a big impact in a very short period of time. And we want to make sure that family members, disconnected youth themselves, uh, friends, colleagues, know that there are resources uh, out there. We want to create re-engagement centers throughout the city and throughout the valley, physical places where people can go to learn about opportunities that are out there. For so many of these young people, they may not realize there's a whole community rooting for them. There's a whole community that wants to provide them with opportunities to get back on a positive path. In Phoenix, Arizona, we don't give up on anyone. Uh, everyone needs to be part of the uh, solution. So we wanna make a significant impact in a very short period of time. And of course, uh, a week from tomorrow uh, in downtown Phoenix City Convention Center, uh, the CEO of Starbucks is gonna be in town along with 20 plus other major nas nationwide employers along with a host of local employers. And we're gonna put on a job fair specifically for Opportunity Youth. It's a very, very exciting event that's gonna happen in eight days. The Opportunity Fair you mentioned is Friday, October 30th. Yeah. It's at the Phoenix Convention Center. And as we talk, we're gonna put up the website so anybody Excellent. who's interested can go on there because I think it 
is helpful if you register for that event beforehand because it's not just about showing up and filling out an application. It's a whole day filled with a lot of speakers and a lot of opportunities, hence the name. Exactly. <laughs> so tell us to talk about we a little bit about. We want to get people psyched up about their uh, future. There may be young people that aren't aware of these opportunities. There are employers out there that we've asked to say, make a specific effort to reach out to this population offer them a job, an entry level position, but let's get them started on a positive pathway in their own lives. We're gonna put over a thousand young people currently unemployed, they're gonna start that day without a job and they're gonna end that day with a job. Lives are gonna change. It's gonna be put on a very positive trajectory in their lives. And some people say, now wait a minute, if one of these young people hasn't graduated from high school, you give them a job, does that take them away from the path on education? And the answer is, that's an old way of thinking. Look at what ASU is doing with Starbucks. Starbucks is going to be hiring over the, around the country over 10,000 opportunity youth. You get a job at Starbucks as a barista, guess what you can get? And a degree from Arizona State University for free online because of that wonderful partnership between ASU and Starbucks. So that entry level position into a service sector position like Starbucks can lead to a higher education and can move that student on to uh, careers in high wage positions. So it's not like it's a job or education. In today's modern economy, we need to we need to provide both levels of support for our young people. The Opportunity Fair, which is part of the larger, uh, the national initiative, involves a lot of companies that are in a lot of cities, you know, the Starbucks and mm -hmm. the Targets and the Walgreens. And I wonder about here in Arizona and in Phoenix, do we have any or will we have any specific companies that really need help? We talk about the construction industry sure. is now returning and they're having a hard time finding framers and sure. plumbers are in need and all that sort of thing. So is that an effort? Yes, uh, so for what's called 100,000 opportunity, 100K opportunities. In fact, that's the name of the website that I know you're gonna show in, uh, throughout this show is 100K opportunities uh, is what you should search on your Google engine or whatever if you wanna participate in this, uh, in this job fair. Yes, some of the major national corporations are coming and they're gonna be providing jobs for these 1,000 plus young people at this job fair. But in addition, we're working with Local First Arizona and there's gonna be local employers right there because as you, you and I both know, as people watching this television show know, the real economic development occurs with small locally owned business. So we gotta make sure that these young people have a path to success in locally owned businesses in addition to the opportunities for uh, national businesses. Now in the industry you just described, yes, the economy is turning around. We're heading in a much more positive direction. We still have some work to do. I'm not Pollyannish about it, but we have a, we're moving in the right direction. We need companies that are committed not just to hiring young people, but providing apprenticeship, apprenticeship opportunities, uh, learning opportunities, you know, g giving students real hands-on experience at work. That's an area, frankly, where the United States of America doesn't do as well as some of our competitor nations around the world. And those nations that do do a better job of giving young people real-world work experiences while they're still getting educated, those are the, co the economies that seem to be doing the best. I think the United States could learn a little bit from those other areas. We've got a great education system here in the United States, but not a perfect one. And providing more hands-on experiences for young people, I think would go a long way to advance our economy. Let's move on to another topic I know you're passionate about. <laughs> Biking, bicycling. Um, when sometimes when this is brought up, you get some snickers from people who think, oh, it's just people who like to ride their bikes around. But Phoenix is pretty serious about this. And I know just this morning, the city launched uh, a public awareness, a safety campaign that's not just geared at somebody who's biking to work or wants to ride down the South Mountain for the weekend. It's a serious issue. Why is it when it comes to safety? Well, we have a bike plan for the city of Phoenix. And when the voters of Phoenix overwhelmingly supported Proposition 104, one of the things they did support was implementation of our bike plan. We're gonna go big on biking in the city of Phoenix, over a thousand miles of bike lane, including dedicated bike lanes. You've seen those beautiful green bikes in the city, in the heart of the city, the grid, the grid bike uh, program. You see more and more people utilizing bikes as their day-to-day -day commuting to and from their places of employment. Biking is very important to the future of our economy. Cities that are more bike friendly, more bikeable, are cities that are more competitive, particularly as it relates to attracting young people, millennials, that we're so, we're in this competitive economy, we wanna get higher educated young people staying in this community, not moving elsewhere, and those from elsewhere moving to this community. And I'm in competition with major cities around the country 
uh, to attract those young people. And having a more bike-friendly city, a more bikeable city, is a very important thing. And we want to make sure people can commute in this city on their bikes as safely as possible. And that involves the responsibility of drivers and a responsibility on the bikers themselves. And the, the campaign you were talking about is a, is a good campaign to educate both, but also educate the, the bike riders that they have a responsibility to obey the uh, laws of the road. They have a responsibility to do their part to keep themselves and their fellow bikers and drivers as safe as possible. Let's move from what's on the street to what's underneath the mm -hmm. streets, talking about pipes. Um, the Water Services Department is working on a five-year financial plan mm -hmm. asking for something like more than $1 billion to address water and wastewater spending, looking at rate increases for six years. Why? Well, um, first off, we're going to go through a whole series of public meetings on that to seek public input and provide a lot of information to the public. So I don't want to get to the end of the story or presume what the end of the story is going to be. But uh, Catherine Sorensen, who is an outstanding director of our water services department, someone I respect and trust uh, a great deal, uh, she is always reminding me and other members of the council that woe is the city that doesn't take care of its infrastructure. If you allow your infrastructure to age too much uh, without replacing it, without doing the necessary repairs, uh, you're not going to be a competitive city over the long haul and the costs of those repairs go up if you don't take care of them. So I think what she's going to do is present a comprehensive plan to ensure that we can provide clean, safe drinking water to every resident of the city, that we can engage in significant conservation planning using our water bill, the rate that citizens pay, use a portion of that on our conservation efforts and also use it appropriately for repairs of our aging infrastructure. A great city plans for its future and keeping up with infrastructure, repairing, making necessary repairs to infrastructure, those are critically important. So I don't know where it's going to end, but we're beginning a very important process of looking at the long-term investment needs of our water infrastructure system in the city of Phoenix. I know the public input is, is expected in November, so I'm sure we'll address this again. I'll be back anytime that you will have me here. Thank you so much, Thank Mayor you. Greg Stanton. Appreciate you coming in. Of course. want to hear from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at ArizonaHorizon at ASU.edu. Former Salt River Project General Manager Jack Feaster was instrumental in the Phoenix area's growth from the 70s through the 90s. However, Feaster's influence spread beyond his leadership at SRP, extending into education and politics, among other things. Author Kathleen Ingley has written a book titled Water, Power, and Persuasion, How Jack Feaster Shaped Modern Arizona. Kathleen Ingley joins us on the show along with Feaster's daughter, Suzanne Feaster. Thank you both for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank Kathleen, you. I'm going to start with you. Why a book on Jack Feaster? Jack 
is the most influential uh, leader who is basically unknown to many modern Arizonans. It's hard to believe because there was a point where everyone knew his name, and yet he was so effective at working behind the scenes that now that he's gone, and uh, he passed away in 2009, people are, they see what he did, but they, they don't know the name attached to it. Suzanne, as you grew up, you mentioned in the book that, that people would refer to his feasterisms. What does that mean? He had a variety of sayings that he used, and, it, uh, and he quoted other people, what gets measured gets done. It's amazing what you can do if you don't need the credit. He had a feaster rule of thirds uh, dealing with nonprofit uh, boards and said there will always be a third that are very engaged, a third that are engaged by project and a third that aren't. And the best thing you can do is not spend lots of energy on the third that aren't, but keep the other two thirds engaged. So it was those kinds of things that he gave as he was mentoring people. Kathleen, you knew him a lot through your work with the Arizona Republic, covering public policy issues. What surprised you or what sorts of things stood out as you did the research and worked on the book? Uh, Jack's incredible level uh, of influence and also I knew him as someone who was very gifted in the art of bringing people together but I didn't quite know how incredibly he, effective he'd been in just such a wide variety of things uh, from dealing with nuclear safety at the national level to uh, water quality in Arizona and the uh, creation of the uh, Department of Environmental Quality. He just had a gift, far greater gift than I knew at the time for creating consensus on very difficult issues and something now that is so timely that is, is the type of talent that we need. I know that he was a, uh, officially a Republican, however, he didn't hold that uh, in favor or against anybody and really worked with everyone, or at least that's his reputation. Suzanne, um, there's another part of the book where you talk about your father invited you to a fundraiser to help a Democrat pay off a debt. And mm -hmm. we've got some photos of your father working with different Democrats and Republicans throughout the state. Talk about that and your experience. I mean, did that seem weird to you? No, my uh, family came in 1882 and the first uh, person that came was a territorial marshal. And in, uh, my great uncle was very, very active in the 50s and 60s in the Democratic Party because Arizona was run by rural Democrats. And so he grew up with a Democratic family, but he became a Republican when he got older. But he was very bipartisan. And he, a couple years before he died, he was phone banking for President Obama. So he had the whole breadth, and it really mattered. The content mattered, not the political ideology. So how did he manage to have his fingers in so many different things and seem to get credit for getting so many things done without getting that big marquee name credit that so many people seek or so many people get? Uh, well, th there's sort of two, two uh, challenges there that, I, that you wonder how he did. Number one was, how did he just accomplish so much? How did he do? He was on so many boards. I think I'm still discovering a few boards that he was on. He was involved in so many organizations and mentored so many people that just last week I learned of two more. And it's hard to understand how you could accomplish so much and still sleep and eat. So um, I, I, my hat is off to him. He, he had incredible focus is, I think, one gift he had. You have a quote from former Phoenix Mayor Terry Goddard in the book that says, uh, if he had a fault, it was that he didn't say no. So growing up, Suzanne, did you ever see your dad? <laughs> he was, yes. Uh, we saw less of him uh, as we were growing up because, and it really was when I got into high school and college that he became CEO of Salt River Project. And it was after we were kind of out of the house that he really had, his career took a trajectory. But in the last 10 years, I talked to him almost every day. He would call my brother, my uncle, and myself virtually every day to check up on us. So family was incredibly important to him. Education also important. Um, talk a little bit, Kathleen, about his role on the Board of Regents when it came to some financial issues with the legislature and also uh, his perception of the universities and you know, um, instituting some requirements for students. 
He was very, very uh, devoted to the idea that education is what helps people succeed and education is what we need to to solve problems that uh, this is how Arizona would become a truly great place is support the, the university system. And one of the challenges when he came in was finances. Uh, surprise, surprise. We're facing these challenges today. We've come very far, <laughs> haven't we? <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and he had the same balancing act that we have now, um, although tuition has gotten very high. Uh, but he was concerned in having an adequate tuition to have quality education, but to have adequate support from the state so that students weren't too burdened. And he did a, a, a very good job at, at trying to balance that. Um, one of the more interesting moments um, when he was a, a regent came when uh, Governor Meekum was on the Board of Regents. And there was a meeting, and it was public time for the public to speak, and a woman spoke. Came, jumped up and started criticizing the governor and called him some not very nice names. And uh, his, one of the regents who was associated, the governor kept saying, point of order, point of order. And it took Jack a minute to react. And then he said, please sit down. And afterwards, he, there were people in the legislature saying, he needs to be turned out of the Board of Regents, he should resign. And he wrote a letter saying, I believe that the public needs a chance to speak, and sometimes they don't speak in the politest of terms. And I've been called far worse things. If you're going to be in the public life, you need to have a very tough hide. And he stayed at the Board of Regents. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was interesting that uh, because it was during some financial difficulties that he said something like, if we don't, the, if we don't help the legislature, they're going to remember that. And so in the end, they instituted an a $850 surcharge which this was back in the 80s. I mean, that's significant. And you don't normally think of, again, if you're thinking this is a, this is a guy who identifies as a Republican, you know, doing something like that necessarily. Yeah, well, I think the, 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 that was the total that it came to. So, so that wasn't the full surcharge. It wasn't quite as awful as it sounds. But, but Jack really took the long view, and he was like someone playing chess. You're look, always looking many moves ahead. And he knew that the, the students were going to have to pay more. That was going to happen. And the regents could seize it and take care of this problem and not antagonize the legislature and do it on their own terms. And this is true throughout his career. He would see inevitably what might happen. Like Salt River Project, originally they were, they were very closed in. They dealt with their own issues. They didn't want to have to deal with big questions <coughs> like water quality and water supply. But he could see well, we could deal with this and help out solve the problem, or we could have a solution imposed on us. And so he was always thinking those extra steps ahead. Thinking down the road, thinking big picture, and right. what's, what's best for the state. Suzanne, you have some memories about uh, the turmoil surrounding the MLK holiday controversy in our state and your father's role in actually getting that holiday. Talk a little bit about that. Well, I remember marching with him. We uh, several before it was a legal holiday. He and I, with all with literally thousands of people, would go and march. And he was very impassioned about this issue and really pushed the Phoenix 40, what now the Greater Phoenix leadership, and just said, "This is a business issue. We need to be in support of it." And so he was deeply involved in that campaign and worked hard to bring other business leaders and bring uh, income in for the campaign in order to support it. What do you think would have, um, what would Arizona look like, do you think today, if your father had run and been elected governor? You know, I vividly remember I was out of college when his picture was on the front of the Phoenix Gazette saying possible candidates. And it was like, oh my gosh, what, what we hadn't thought about that. <laughs> Um, I think he would have been, I don't know that he would have been the best campaigner. I think he would have been a fabulous governor. But I think this was the role he felt best in, was being a, a leader where it needed to be, but a convener. He really had that gene of convening and bringing people and bringing diverse interests together and respecting and allowing those diverse interests to play out. That was the best role for him of anything, and I think it's the role he enjoyed the most. Kathleen, we have less than 30 seconds here. Tell me, how do you sell Jack Feaster somebody? Why should they read that book? 
If you want to solve today's problems, you need to look at someone who knew how to solve problems, the same type of problems we're facing today. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Both of you, Suzanne and Kathleen, thanks for coming in. Thank you. Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalists' Roundtable. Governor Doug Ducey is considering revising his education funding plan, and a former lawmaker would like to revamp the Independent Redistricting Commission. That's coming up Friday on the Journalists' Roundtable. I'm Christina Estes in for Ted Simons. We thank you for joining us. Have a great night. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.